All right. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this month's What's the 411 webinar. Um, with me this evening is my wonderful colleague, Jason Altman. Jason, if you want to say hello to everyone. Hey, how's everybody doing? Thank you, Jenny, for having me here. It's a pleasure. I'm uh, I'm excited to learn what's the 411 tonight. <laughs> Absolutely. We're really excited to have you this evening. Um, so those of you that have joined us on 411 webinars before, you kind of know the format, but just to review really quickly, each month we host um, what's the 411, which is a webinar series where we focus on four integration strategies. Uh, one program, and then one trending topic. So this evening, I'll be covering the four integration strategies, as well as the program. And then I'll hand it over to Jason, who is going to be talking about not-so-common 21st century assessments and really diving into some really great examples of assessment strategies that you can use in your classroom and you could even use starting tomorrow. So with that, we'll go ahead and dive in. And the first section this evening is the four integration strategies. Um, so we have a wonderful new series that started just a few months ago called SOS, or Spotlight on Strategies. And this is a weekly digital media integration challenge. So uh, they're posted on our blogs, and I'll give you the URL to that in just a second. Um, but every Monday, a new strategy comes out, and it gives you an example of how to integrate uh, a, an asset, a type of media, digital media, um, from Discovery Education directly into your classroom with a specific strategy. So this evening, we're going to be focusing on four of those. Um, how you find this, these series, and they're wonderful to share with your colleagues and peers, uh, if you go to denblogs.com, that's www.denblogs.com, on the top blue border, you're going to see SOS at the top, and you can see the arrow pointing to that there. And once you click on SOS, it's going to list all of the SOS strategies that we have. I think currently we have almost 30, and um, they're being added every week. So what's great about these is that as you click on each one, it gives you a PDF version, um, and it provides the background about why this specific strategy is beneficial to use in your classroom. It gives you an example, um, and it gives you even a challenge or a bonus if you really want to step it up and take it to the next level. What's great about the PDF version is that you can print these off, share these with your colleagues. If you're looking to host your own, you know, after-school PD or DEN event, this is a great, these are great tools to use. Um, so that's how you find them on the DEN blog. So the first one that we're going to talk about this evening is a strategy called Quick Write. Um, having your students just write really quickly uh, is a really great way to help them develop their fluency um, and really to help them become more reflective in their, as they're learning and just put things into their own words and to really help synthesize information. It also provides a great way um, to informally assess student thinking. So I know that Tonight, we're talking a lot about assessment, and this is a great way to assess where students are based on what they are able to write very quickly. So let's say, for example, that you are my students, and um, I have this picture up on the, on the board or on the screen, and I give you 60 seconds. So the idea of a quick write is that it's very quick. So let's say 30 to 60 seconds, and I'm going to ask you to either write as many adjectives as you can think of when you look at this picture, or write as many facts. Um, or things that come to mind when you look at this picture. So Jason, I'm going to call on you if you can, if you have any adjectives that you would use to describe this image, what would it be? I think warm, sunny, um, cloudy, let's see, dry. Um, those come to mind very quickly. Um, desolate, beautiful. Nice. Nice use of vocabulary. Uh, Very nice. <laughs> yes. Kayak, a <bubble>. bull. <laughs> there you go. So the idea. <laughs> thank you for thank you for being my uh, volunteer there, Jason. I appreciate it. Um, so the my idea pleasure. being again that you, you're just giving students a very short period of time to write. Um, and again, in this particular example, they're using adjectives or facts or statements about the the picture. So just a really quick way to help them with fluency and, um, you know, with those writing skills, and it's a great way to assess. So that's the first uh, integration strategy called Quick Write. The second one uh, has to do with journals. Um, I know that many teachers and students use, journal, uh, use journals or do journaling in the classroom to reflect and to allow students to put information into their own words. Um, and the research does show that students are more successful um, 
and find school more satisfying when they're taught in ways that are responsive to their readiness levels and interests and their learning profiles. So this is a, a great strategy to use to really differentiate for students based on the way that they learn. Um, so if you take a journal, if you have just kind of a composition notebook that they're using for a journal, you can use either side of the page for this, or if you just have a piece of paper, you could even fold it in half. So the idea being that on one side of the journal, they're drawing a picture to represent a concept um, or an idea, and then on the right-hand side, they're writing the linguistic um, summarization of what they've learned. Um, so it gives them an opportunity to put it in their own words in different ways. Maybe they're really into drawing and they're great artists and they love to draw, they're, they're visual learners and they love to draw what they're thinking and learning, whereas other students are um, really strong when it comes to verbal and auditory learning. So it gives them an opportunity to do both and really to shine which of the two is stronger for them. So that's the idea of using journals for non-linguistic as well as linguistic re representations of concepts. The third um, integration strategy we'll talk about this evening is called tabletop texting. And I know there's a lot of, um, you know, discussion today about whether or not to allow students to have cell phones in the classroom. Um, but this is actually a really fun way for students to use their phones and text one another, but for the purpose of learning what we're talking about in the classroom. And you can see here that um, today texting for many students is the number one mode of communication. And it says that they, um, kids between the age of 12 and 17 send at least six, um, send at least 60 texts a day. Uh, and I would even say probably some of them do much, much more than that. So let's meet them where they are and let's allow them to do this, but for the purpose of learning. So this example would start with a student um, texting to another student a statement and a question, where that student then has to respond to the question first and then prompt with another statement and question. So it goes back and forth, back and forth as they're continuing to ask questions, respond to the question, and then answer. So it's a really fun way to allow them to bring the phones into the classroom, um, but for the purpose of learning the content and sharing information with one another. And our final of the four integration strategies this evening is called Did You Hear That? Um, if you think about, uh, you know, sounds and how sounds really help students or help individuals put mental pictures in, uh, and images in their mind. And the more that we can help students create these mental images, that learning goes much deeper and can be more permanent um, and processed in their brain. And so there, it's great to be able to leverage sound um, in the classroom to help students create those mental images. And what's great about discovery education is that we have hundreds of sounds. We have songs, we have, um, you know, sound effects, we have all sorts of different types of sounds in discovery education. So this idea being that you take a sound effect and you play it for the students uh, and then you ask them to write a story based on what they're listening to. So you don't tell them what the sound is. Um, maybe it could be, you know, a sound of someone walking upstairs and the stairs are creaking, but you don't necessarily tell them that's what it is, but you have them write their story just by listening to the sound. Um, so it helps them with, you know, language and fluency as well. It's a writing, it's a writing prompt, um, but it's, they're creating this mental image in their head about what they think that sound is, is about. Um, and then if you want to take it to the next level, you could even integrate that sound using a program like GarageBand or Audacity and have the students read the story that they wrote. So again, um, just to recap, those were the four integration strategies, and you can find those all on the DEN blogs if you go to denblogs.com and click on SOS. So those are our four integration strategies. Hopefully you'll find those helpful. Um, I love when they come out each week. I think they're just so creative and fun and just something you can instantly use in your classroom. So let's talk a little bit about the one program that we're going to feature this evening, and that program is the DEN Summer Institute. The Den Summer Institute is a um, fully immersive, kind of residential style, professional development experience for educators that we host every summer. And we host it all across the nation. And this summer, it's being hosted in uh, Burlington, Vermont. Um, and it's just an incredible opportunity for our community to gather together. We have over 100 educators that gather together 
um, and for a week full of networking and professional development and growth. Um, and we host these, as I said, all over the country. Last year we were in Bozeman, Montana, which was absolutely phenomenal. And we got an opportunity to go to Yellowstone, take some pictures, and spend the day exploring that national landmark. Um, and as you can see, we've been all across the country over the past few years. But it's really a powerful opportunity for Den Stars to connect with one another. Um, by attending the Den Summer Institute. And what's great about it is that once you, uh, if you pay your way there um, with airfare, everything is covered for you. So lodging, food, entertainment, everything is covered for those uh, five days. So if you're interested in learning more about the Den Summer Institute, and I'll go back just one page, um, you can go to dlc.com slash densi. And with that, I am going to hand it over to Jason for our trending topic of the evening, which is not so common 21st century assessment. So Jason, I will hand it, I'm going to pass the ball over to you. So give me just a second here. So you have control of the presentation here. And uh, again, thank Sounds you for joining fine. us this evening. Thank you very much, Jenny. And, uh, you know, Jenny, as, as I go through this, uh, please let me know about any questions that there might be, and, uh, you know, we'll stop and answer questions uh, at the end for sure as well. Um, and I think this presentation really is, is meant to be, uh, you know, a conversation starter around some of these topics. And, and uh, like Jenny said, hopefully you're able to kind of go away from this next half hour or so with a couple, you know, tips or, or, or fun things you might be able to try in your classroom, um, but also hopefully just with the, uh, maybe the motivation and the inspiration to see what else is out there. Like, wow, I, I saw a couple cool tips here on this particular webinar, but, but I bet there's a ton more out there. Um, I bet there's a bunch of, of apps for my tablet that I haven't even explored that it would be a fun way for some students to be able to show me what they know and what they can do um, in this 21st century environment that we teach in. I'm actually going to move forward one slide here as we get started and just let you know that this presentation that I have um, is available to you if you want to quick grab that QR code. I'll just leave that up while I talk for a second. And even QR codes, as you think about ways to, in our 21st century classroom, as we're trying to differentiate our instruction for students and provide students with the, uh, the learning experiences that they need at a specific moment, how we might be able to use QR codes to provide the right assessments for the right students in a way to maybe level assessments for students in a way that doesn't seem like, you know, there's a, there's a smart group and a not a smart group. You know, we have a blue group, a yellow group, a green group, and, and each group knows to go and get their QR code so that they're able to participate and, and uh, get the right assignment or performance task or uh, authentic learning task uh, that they might be doing as part of the uh, formal evaluation process on that particular skill. Um, so think of QR codes as kind of a neat way to be able to do that. And QR codes are, are so easy to make. All you do is, is you need a, a URL of some kind. Think about, you know, even Discovery Education's Quiz Builder, for example, would have a URL attached to it. You would take that URL, put it into some kind of a, a QR code generator, and there's millions out there. I like QR stuff because it lets me change, lets me change the color. Um, so in that particular example of, of being able to provide a few different ones, um, qrstuff.com. And then in about one second, entering that, that URL, um, I'm able to get a download of that QR code, and I could put that anywhere I wanted to in my classroom. So. We're working in this world where things are kind of really transforming around us, and it's kind of one step as, at a time. And I know everybody is, is really following what's happening with the Common Core, and as we're moving, you know, maybe your state, um, moving quickly into um, teaching along the Common Core, um, teaching some things that may have been taught the year before or the year after in your particular grade level, going a lot deeper in certain subjects that, that maybe weren't things that you focused so much on before, trying to, um, you know, tie together knowledge across multiple subject areas in ways that you didn't do before. And kind of along with all of that is the need for some new strategies, maybe to be able to, you know, get a good, accurate understanding of what our students know and what they can do. And we're going to talk about some of those right now. Um, 
just first, uh, I just want to spend a couple seconds talking about the Common Core Assessment Consortia and where they're going, because they can kind of point us in the right direction. Um, and I know everybody gets a lot of information about the uh, the park and Smarter Balance, kind of the, the regular assessment uh, consortia, if you will. But I just wanted to provide a little bit of information about some other consortia that are working in ways that are, you know, in the end benefit all students, but working um, for specific subgroups of students um, right now as well. And, and sometimes they don't necessarily get as much press. And, you know, one of those uh, consortia, actually there's two consortia that are working, um, building some things out and a, a summative assessment as well as an entire system for students with disabilities, and in particular, students with significant cognitive disabilities. So if you're a special educator, um, if you're somebody who has students with disabilities who are integrated into your classroom, um, some nice things to be able to follow here. And, and one of the key differences as you look at this slide is that what's happening now is this kind of integration between the curriculum, the instruction, and the assessment in a way that it wasn't necessarily tied together when all of the assessments at the end of the year were kind of created by the states. And one of the wonderful things that ha is happening right now, and this is why I think all educators should pay attention, um, this is just a little kind of infographic from NCSC's uh, consortium, the National Center and State Collaborative. Um, but the digital library of curriculum instruction and classroom, classroom assessment resources the one thing that NCSC has said that they would do is they have said that this would be available to everybody um, as soon as it's as soon as it's ready and as soon as it's complete. You don't have to be your state doesn't have to be a member of that consortium. You don't have to be a state level representative. So you know, pay attention to that digital library and also the communities of practice um, thing is a big thing with with that particular consortium. So educators are getting out to work with educators in the field. And so if you're somebody who would like a little professional development on uh, being able to work with students with disabilities in your classroom, who wants to understand a little more about what might be available in that digital library, pay attention to what NCSC has going on and Dynamic Learning Maps is, is the other consortia. Pay attention to what they're doing and things they might be doing in your area. You might be surprised about the opportunities that are available to you. And then just some, some information about our, our assessments for students who are ELL students. Um, kind of right now, at the end of the year, there's this summative testing experience for our ELL students, but it's you know, it's paper and pencil in most most cases. Uh, the students don't necessarily get a good chance to really connect the oral speaking and writing fluency and, and, and other types of, of tests that kind of all seem segmented. And what's happening right now, you may have heard of WIDA. It's uh, English Language Development uh, or English Language a Consortium that works with states on, on issues surrounding English language learners. And uh, WIDA is the, the leader of our um, common core consortia for English language learners, and that is called ASSETS. And just a few things that you should know if you are an educator in a state who might be part of ASSETS, know that you're going to be transitioning to a computer-based assessment from a paper-based language proficiency assessment. A lot of amazing things happen when we can kind of get into that technological space. Uh, but the great thing is that there's going to be screeners there's going to be interim and formative assessments, and I think that's why this becomes important to everybody. I think many of us have students who are English language learners, or even students who just struggle with some of their language skills, right, and maybe aren't formally English language learners. And it's nice to know that there's some interim and formative resources that are going to be out there. Just kind of keep the assets consortia, A-S-S-E-T-S, -S -E consortia on your radar and, and pay attention to what's going on there. Just a little information about PARC, and if you're a PARC uh, state, you'll notice one of the big things that's happening with PARC, and, and PARC is a, one of the regular assessment consortia for summative assessments. You'll notice that formative assessment piece, and that there's going to be some resources available for diagnostic and mid-year assessments, speaking and listening assessments, things that weren't necessarily available before. And I think the big one here is the performance-based assessment. And uh, it's, it's yet to be determined whether this is going to be, all of these will be assessments that are able to be taken online or whether they'll be paper and pencil tests. But know 
that the Pirate Consortium is going to making performance-based assessment, and that's what we're going to come back to in a second, but performance-based assessment, a strong part of what everybody wants to be able to measure your student doing, your student authentically engaging in performance-based tasks and, and assessing what they know and what they can do through those tasks. And then the Smarter Balance Consortium, the other regular assessment consortia, you notice again performance assessments um, there. And the, the one thing that's kind of the major difference between Park and Smarter Balance, um, sometimes different states are a part of these consortia. Some states are a part of both. And uh, some states actually aren't part of either, but are kind of following along. But if you kind of follow along what's going on with Smarter Balance, again, we've got the performance assessment tasks. One thing to keep in mind and to know is that this particular assessment is going to be, as it gets to the end of year assessment, is going to be online and is actually going to be computer adaptive. One of the wonderful things you see that comes along with the Smarter Balance Consortium is, again, that digital library, the formative assessments, the tasks, the example tasks, things that might be available. And no matter what state that your district might reside in and where that state might you know, be as far as the consortia, know that Park and Smarter Balance has some released performance tasks out there and available that might be great resources for you to be able to try to bring into your classroom. And I've got an example of that right here. And this is a re released item from the Smarter Balance Consortium. So you can see where in a summative sense, some of these tests might be going, but how it might be wonderful to be able to bring these experiences into our classroom a little bit. And you can see how we've got a performance task, bringing together an article and a video, writing some questions, and being able to explain some of the topics that were discussed in the video. And, and that's a big part of these performance tasks and a big part of the Common Core. Actually, I think uh, the word evidence itself is uh, referenced 122 times, I think it is, in the Common Core Standards. So, you know, the requirement of, of, you know, having evidence to support your conclusions, to support your writing, uh, to understand what it means to be able to provide evidence that helps you show that you know what you're supposed to be able to know and that you can do what we hope you're able to do. And just uh, an example of, a, you know, the note-taking thing that might go with that uh, performance-based assessment. So performance tasks, and I think we're kind of going to go this direction here from here on out um, with this particular um, presentation and this particular webinar. And as I look at performance tasks, and this is kind of a, a definition of performance tasks that's pulled, uh, and I actually can't even remember which, uh, which consortium this is from, but the thing that, that really stands out to me here is we're talking about real-world tasks. Um, we're talking about multiple approaches. I love that, that view of multiple approaches and multiple points of view and interpretations. It allows the students, I think, to be able to do something that is so important. And that is it gives the students multiple ways to show us that they, it gives them flexibility and creativity in showing us that they do understand the skills that, that we're trying to measure. And I think that's a big part of the 21st century learning experience and, and hopefully the new kind of 21st century assessment experience and evaluation experience in our classrooms. All of us are beginning to try to find ways to differentiate our instruction and to try to meet students with, you know, different types of modalities as we try to kind of impart our information and, and push that information out to our students. So as we try to pull that knowledge back and gain insight into what our students know and what they can do. I think so often we ask them for that information back in like just one way, right? We have a, uh, a multiple choice question, we have a paper and pencil quiz or assignment. And so even though we're delivering our instruction in many different ways to meet students where their strengths are uh, and where we know that they'll learn best and the experiences that they'll learn best in, when it comes time to be able to measure that learning, then we say so often right now, well, all of you have to kind of act the same now as you try to show me what you know and what you can do. And performance tasks really open up, I think, a new world for us and, and do some really amazing things. So kind of the first thing that goes along with those performance tasks is one of the things we need to start doing is, is measuring some of our students' behaviors with rubrics. And there's a lot of places uh, to be able to get rubrics online. Rubistar comes to mind, and, and if you just, you know, 
Google teaching rubrics, she would come up with a million hits. Um, but what I'm going to try to kind of convince you of doing over the next five minutes or so is to start developing your own rubrics and to kind of ease up on feeling like they have to be perfect at the very beginning, knowing that along with the student work, your rubrics can kind of be free flowing and, and things that are able to, you know, that you're able to, you know, work with and, and just, you know, really start to hone in on exactly what you're looking for as you go through the process as well. But I think just in general, when we're talking about rubrics, we're talking about ways to measure the quality of a student's work, right? And we're trying to figure out, you know, and, and be able to show, like, exactly what the quality is and, and what the pathway might be to that quality. And I think a lot of times what we do with rubrics uh, when we build them right now is we could actually probably substitute checklists for many of the items that we might try to measure on a rubric. So uh, we might say something like, you must cite 14 sources to get a 4 and 10 sources to get a 3. And that's actually just a checklist. Did you measure 14 or did you mention 14 or did you mention 12? Do you deserve a 4 or a 3 on this rubric for your performance? But really what we should be getting at is the quality of those references and how the students cited that evidence and, and the quality of the connection uh, in their work to those to those references. And so that's something to keep in mind um, that's very important with our rubrics. When we're using a rubric, we're really trying to see, and I like this statement here, what does better look like, right? How do we measure on that continuum from beginners to masters? And what does creativity look like? I'm just going to quickly move into another slide. No, it's not best practice to just read off your slide, but I just want to make that available um, in the PowerPoint if you're able to go and grab that. Think about what this does um, and, and being able to measure from you know, kind of beginners to masters in skills and being able to measure creativity. What that does to some of our special populations and does for some of our special populations, right? All of a sudden, something isn't just right or wrong. Like, my best has value. I don't have to fear failure. And I, have, I feel like I'm interested and I'm engaged in this process because I know whatever I do, it's going to fit somewhere on this continuum. And my teacher is going to work with me to continue to move up my performance. A quality rubric is going to allow me a time, and I think this is very important as well, to reflect and to improve upon my work. It's going to give me feedback and different pathways to success. Some of this information that, just as a side note, um, is available on Discovery Education's uh, Kathy Strax. Uh, some of her teaching guides have some um, quality connections to, you know, some, some great information about developing a quality rubric. So if you look at Kathy Strax guides, um, you'll find some good information there, so feel free to go there. This is actually one of those things, and, and one of the links from Kathy Schrock's information is to qualityrubrics.pbworks.com. I just thought this was a great way to start to think about how we would formulate rubrics. So we've got our dimensions of the work that are so important to us to measure, and we would create those as the rows. Then we've got our different levels, and then we've got language in the cells, and that's the content. That's, you know, this is exactly what we're trying to measure here. And there's some important considerations um, to keep in mind as we start to think about the different levels and the different content that we might have within a rubric. And this is where I think it becomes so important to say, you know what, we just kind of go for it. We get some things down in writing, um, but we know that we can have, you know, our own revisions in our rubrics. Let's get it out, work with the students through a draft, and let the students help us further define this rubric and further de define the content of that rubric. Let's be willing to kind of revise things and slowly and steadily start to perfect that rubric for that particular task even more. It's going to be important for us to consider as we think about the different levels, whether we want to measure from low to high or high to low. And I think that's going to depend on maybe some of the types of things we're measuring. I really prefer rubrics that measure from low to high uh, one of the nice things it does is it, it shows people, it shows our students where that entry level is. As I walk through the door, um, you know, in this skill and in performing this skill, 
where are some of the places where I can kind of make that entry? And then on the high end, it kind of says, you know what, it could be even more high quality than this particular level and, and, and this particular um, measurement. We just kind of ran out of paper on the right side. So continue to try to do your best as students um, to push towards the right end of this rubric. So I think in a lot of cases, low to high works. But I think there's also um, instances where a rubric that runs high to low on the levels might be most appropriate. I just I think what's most important is that as we kind of go through and as we revise, we really think about the best way to lay out those levels. And then another thing as we think about measuring these performance tasks, and, and we'll get into different types of things we might be able to measure in just a second, but it's so important to have a quality measurement of these tasks to really embrace them and bring them into our classrooms is, does every student know their place, right? Do we have certain things built into our rubric so that a novice knows how to advance to the next steps, that it doesn't seem like such a wide gap that it's not worth trying anymore to be able to get from one level to the next. And again, I mentioned this just before, but just to finish our conversation here about rubrics, include those students in the development of the rubrics. Imagine the buy-in that that's going to promote as far as your students doing their best on a particular task. And imagine the things that you can gain from their insights, you know, 30 young young minds and, and and really um, engaged brains in your classroom trying to tell you what they hope to be measured on as they engage and move into a certain performance task. So what are some ways we might be able to deliver some assignments, some performance tasks to our students? And the first thing that kind of comes to mind for me is within Discovery Education, our assignment builder and our builder tools. Um, one of the really wonderful things about Assignment Builder is it's a great way for us to use, you know, some great discovery education content, videos, images, some of the things that uh, Jenny talked about earlier, to be able to pull them all together um, within one assignment to be able to connect a rubric to that assignment, for example, and to deliver it to our students through the Student Center within Discovery Education. Um, through making QR codes for those assignments, for example, when we have different groups working on, on different um, activities. And uh, I just, yeah, I think there's so much potential out there for Assignment Builder. I know that it's something that not every educator is using right now and not every student has access to. And so, you know, keep in mind your builder tools as, uh, as you start to think about ways you might be able to deliver a performance task within your classroom. Along with that, um, some of the educators within kind of the, the discovery education um, world and those who have discovery education tools, many have the assessment tools. And know that, you know, with these assessments, we've got these um, kindergarten through high school tests and their benchmark kind of interim assessments that happen three to four times a year, is a tool called uh, Progress Zone, a way for us to provide formative support. Now, what we can do here is we can start with a, a uh, item bank of, I think it's about 60,000 items that are multiple choice and start to put little quizzes and probes together for our students. But what's really beautiful about that is we can go, we can create our own questions and we can, in, we can include and create performance tasks within that system. We can attach them two, maybe three or four or five multiple choice questions. So we're getting, you know, we're getting measurements of our students in a couple different ways. You know, I want some kind of harder measurement, um, more quantitative information, give me some numbers. This student was able to show that they understood this skill on three out of five multiple choice questions, but then also give them the chance to be creative and to, uh, and to show me what they know in a different performance type of environment. And that's one thing we can do through progress on as well. And I'm just quickly going to share with you my uh, Chrome, which I have open right now, because there's one thing I want to show you. And Ginny, maybe if you can just tell me um, when we're go, are you able to see my student center? Um, yep, just popped up. Okay, excellent. One of the cool new like highlights uh, that's going to be available very soon within Discovery Education to students, and again, as we would maybe assign assignments to our students through the Student Center, get our students active within Student Center, is a tool called Board Builder. 
I'm just going to quickly just demo both Ford Builder for a second. As we move and while, there, while that's see, loading, Jason, um, I had the yep, opportunity a few weeks. I had the uh, opportunity a few weeks ago to show Ford Builder to a group of high school students in Albuquerque, and they absolutely loved it. They dove right in and, and figured out immediately how to use this. Um, and I think it's a great tool um, to really empower students to start creating information um, and, and you know, being able to easily pull from all of the content within Discovery Education. So as, as Jason shows this, um, I've had the opportunity to show both teachers and students, and it's been just, they've just been excited every time. So I'm really, really excited mm -hmm. about this new feature within the Student Center. And I think the one wonderful thing that this does is remember that word evidence that I mentioned being so um, focused on so heavily within the Common Core Standards. This is a tremendous way for students to be able to connect the things that they might create to actual evidence and to be able to pull them from the place that they're familiar with and they're comfortable with. Um, for example, within Discovery Education here, I can just add quickly a uh, an image or a video or an encyclopedia article or something like that, and, and we'll just you know quickly add something here um, so you can see how easy it is. You know, maybe I want to use this sharks. Uh, oops, that was uh, absolutely the wrong thing to click on. We'll go back here. Oops. Here we go. Okay. Uh, let's use maybe this video, for example. I might want to add this video. I'm way in. This is a, you know what, Jenny? I'm not an expert user of Board Builder, but would you say that the students had a much easier time using this tool than I'm having right now? <laughs> Uh, I think, you and know, isn't, I mean, that yeah, always, isn't that always the way it goes? <laughs> right. There's, there's always a little bit of a learning curve, um, but they picked it right up. They mm -hmm. had a couple of questions. But what um, Jason is showing you right now is the fact that when Here students build a board, um, use Board Builder to build a board, when they click on that search option to find something um, or to upload or to, you know, add something to their board, it's searching all of the content that they have access to to in Discovery Education, as well as there's an option to upload your own content. So for um, students who have created a quick movie or, you know, um, created a PowerPoint or a Word document, it's not just pulling from content from Discovery, but it allows them to upload in a variety of formats, all sorts of format types. Um, you know, if you've got a smart notebook file, if you've got a Promethean flip chart file that they've created, upload just about anything directly onto this board as well as adding um, their own text and information. So it's just a great way mm -hmm. to, as Jason mentioned, cite their evidence and show, you know, with evidence what they're learning um, in really creative and fun ways to build their own bo virtual board. Yeah. And one, I think, amazing thing that that does, too, it opens, as we talk about, you know, going back to that rubric-based assessment um, and the to back and forth that would happen between teachers and students as students are able to kind of perfect their craft and, and perfect their performance with, with multiple opportunities to show what they know and show that they understand. A great way to be able to do that is through the student center, back to the educator, and then back to the student. And I think that's really, really great, really wonderful as well. So we'll, uh, let's see, stop sharing Google Chrome and go back to the PowerPoint. Another tool that's, you know, very interesting, I think, is, is something that can help us is as we go into and we have some performance tests, it might be important every once in a while to kind of see where our classroom is, and there's a great tool for that. Um, you may have used Poll Everywhere before, um, a way to be able to kind of quickly poll our students. Sometimes as we get into performance tasks and things that might take a little longer to measure, it's important for us as educators to have some tools that help us quickly gather information about where our classroom is at and about where our students are at. And one tool that takes that kind of a step further is Socrative. And, and what Socrative does, it kind of takes that polling technology using whatever device a student might have in front of them, and it allows us to deliver questions to their device. It allows us to track kind of those student responses so we can connect responses to individual students in a way that Poll Everywhere is not able to do. Um, and I think Socrative is a great tool for us to be able to do that. Um, maybe we have some PhotoPeach users out there already. 
Um, and I think a lot of people are using PhotoPeach to be able to kind of put together some digital storytelling. But did you know that within PhotoPeach, there is the ability to kind of embed some questions and embed some multiple choice questions or um, open-ended responses and things like that um, within the tool. So we can use this two ways, right? We could use this to ask our students questions, but I think sometimes even better, we could allow our students in their digital storytelling, ask them or promote um, the behavior of putting them in the, I guess, the position of teacher. What are the questions that you think are important to ask about this topic? Show me that you understand this information so well that you're able to develop some very important questions about it that you think it's important that everybody knows the answer. Um, so PhotoPeach is a nice, cool tool. Sometimes, as part of a performance task, it might be nice to be able to put our students into a game situation, right, and, and to let them kind of play but allow ourselves to be able to measure, you know, how they're doing on that playing. You know, as part of a performance assignment, we might ask them to go to one of our games within Discovery Education. And um, one thing you might not have known is if you have Discovery Education Streaming Plus, there are about 300 games within the system. But whether you have Discovery Education Streaming Plus or not, all of those games are available at a website called iknowthat.com. And I'm just going to quickly go back to my um, Chrome, uh, go back to the web right now, and I'm going to pull up uh, iknowthat.com. You can see here we've got a ton of different game resources for multiple grades, multiple subject areas. Maybe we're measuring math, and maybe we're measuring math at the fourth grade level, for example. Um, you know, let's just take a quick look. The one thing we have in this, this free version we have to kind of deal with is there's some ads floating out there, but Math Dojo, Math Blocks, and lots of different games that can help our students practice those skills and where, you know, part of the assignment might be at the end you'll get a results page. And I want to know your results. Take a screenshot of your results or as you're maybe monitoring the students going through these performance tasks and going through this um, series of, of assignments that you've assigned to them, um, you might be able to monitor that. For those who uh, teach students who might be a little bit older, another great game um, resource is Game on Learning. And that is uh, available at this website. You can just Google Game on Learning, but you can notice now we've got middle school and some high school games in many different subject areas as well. And this was put together uh, by a few educators uh, going through a teacher education program. And what an amazing thing that they've done in kind of pulling all of these different game resources together and putting them in one spot for us. Another great tool as far as games is thumbdog.com. I'm logged in here. Um, I just want to be able to give you a quick little feel. The one thing that's very cool about thumbdog.com is the teacher is able to use the Common Core and to use the math standards to deliver very specific questions to every student, to meet them exactly where they are. And so kind of taking that game experience, but really owning it um, and using it to differentiate our, our instruction to students and to give them questions that are exactly on the types of things you might be teaching them at that time. And another thing that's very cool is um, kind of in a 21st century um, you know, learning experience, it brings that experience for the student outside of their own classroom. And one thing that's really cool right now, you can see I'm actually playing a student from Canada in this game. We're probably getting different questions. I'm going to go ahead and miss a couple because during this webinar, I think it would be really bad for me to, you know, go and, and beat a, uh, a third grader from, uh, from Canada in front of everybody. But um, we'll each get five questions here, and the educator is able to measure how well the students are doing. Based, they're able to get a, like a results sheet uh, from this particular game, which is kind of a nice thing. So as we think of ways for students to practice their skills, while well, they might be putting together something that's more of a performance uh, type of uh, experience, it's important for us to have them have some opportunities to practice as well. So, and I love this type of a, I love this type of a resource. <laughs> um, I love this type of a resource, Jason, because um, you know, at, at, you just mentioned that um, they need to have 
opportunity to practice, and sometimes it's just a matter of, you know, repetitive practice over and over. But it also um, is fun, and it's a game. And uh, there's a book that's out that I read about a year ago. It's called A New Culture of Learning. It's by Douglas Thomas and John Seeley Brown, and it's a phenomenal book, and it talks about the importance of play in learning. And so I think, you know, um, there's just so many opportunities to allow students to learn through that play. And if you think about young mm -hmm. students or you think about young kids, you know, those two, three, four, and five-year-olds, that's how they learn. They learn th through play. Um, and you go into any preschool and they're learning through play. They're learning through songs and music and, and games, um, but that's how they're making sense of the world around them. And just because we get older doesn't mean that we can't continue to play with our knowledge. So I think this is a great resource yeah. to allow students to do that. And I think also, you know, one of the things we worry about as educators, Jenny, is that we can't measure that play, right? And I think some of these tools right. do such a wonderful job of allowing us to understand what's happening inside that play for our students. And though it may feel like, for example, in, in the case of Sundog, where it really feels like play for our students and where they're doing these amazing things like connecting with students, you know, outside of their classroom and different communities, we are structuring it to kind of meet the needs of what, what we're trying to teach that student at that time, right? It's, you know, it's not just a free-for-all. Um, and these tools, they're all free. They do a really nice job of, of bringing that play atmosphere, that game atmosphere, and making it an engine that we can actually deliver some practice through and helps us deliver that content and instruction yeah. to the students. Um, another tool, and there's a great um, PowerPoint out there that I found, um, and here's just an example of that. It was actually 40 different ways Prezi, um, I think 40 ways to use Prezi for assessment in your classroom. Try to Google that. Um, if I um, actually can find that, I'll do that as soon as we're done. I'll see if I can't add that URL to this particular slide. So if you've grabbed uh, the presentation through that uh, QR code, um, hopefully it'll be there. But to use them to make, for example, um, here we've got, you know, a very dynamic presentation. And, and what we're doing here is trying to, uh, I just made, you know, animal stars. So, you know, what are the things that a couple different things have alike? Uh, what, are, what are some things? that are different about two particular topics. Let's make a dynamic Venn diagram, but let's embed images and let's embed video and let's embed some of these other things. It allows students to cite that evidence um, of their work within that kind of dynamic Venn diagram. And you know, they could link all of the text that they write to different types of resources. It can be a great way for us to measure that the students are actually doing some of the things that we are hoping that they do as they might build together these presentations. Another uh, great tool for educators to be able to use is Quizlet. And a lot of you might be very familiar with making flashcards for your students, maybe to help prepare them for an end of chapter exam. And the reason I included Quizlet here is actually to kind of turn its use on its head. And have you ever considered having the students develop the flashcards? So in order for me to show my understanding to my teacher, and I know that, that my teacher's been working so hard with me on this particular topic, I need to be able to come up with 10 or 15 flashcards to be able to share with my teacher. The teacher can then kind of maybe put those together. The classroom educator is able to then, you know, make a, a summation of all of the best cards they get and then get some cards out to the students to be able to practice before a summative assessment. But a great way to kind of create a performance task for the students and to allow them to be creative in showing what they know and what they understand is actually turn the creation of those cards over to the students. So that can be done in Quizlet, uh, kind of a, I think, a neat way to maybe be able to use Quizlet. Another great resource for us to use is Skitch. And again, these are all free resources. Skitch is just an app that you can, uh, you can download that for a tablet. You can download it onto your computer. Um, but a way for us to be able to take images and to be able to kind of embed our text onto an image, again, in trying to cite evidence and, and be creative. This is in front of you right now is just an example of instead of having a multiple choice or a matching test about maybe dates, and, uh, and things that happened in, uh, this is, I think, a, a map of Arizona and Arizona history. 
let's have you actually place them on the map, show me a third dimension that you actually know the geography of things and can understand where they are. Um, and I just use Sketch to do that. You know, some of the, the, the things that are, um, the topics that are available on SOS, I know one of them is six word stories. Imagine taking an image and allowing a student to be able to um, write their six word story in Sketch, just to, you know, even on a tablet, for example, to handwrite it. Um, so enabling our youngest students to be able to do some creative things right on top of that image. Or having them come up with three truths and a lie about a particular image or something like that. Sketch allows us to really be very dynamic with the use of images in performance tasks uh, so that our students can really be creative with things. And then I just wanted to close uh, with a tool that's really great as we think of our younger students. You know, sometimes uh, our older students can be very creative getting into uh, lots of these different tools, um, extra normal and uh, now all of a sudden I'm kind of having my mind like, but some of the, the other tools that, that students can use to, to really put together something very fun that shows that, that they understand and, and that they, they know the information and the skills that we've been working with them on. But sometimes we feel like our younger students aren't necessarily maybe capable of, of being able to use those tools. But there are some tools that are meant for them as well. And I'm quick going to go back to uh, my web site here. I'm going to go to ZimmerTwins.com. I'm quick going to put my phone on speaker as well just so you can get a little um, audio. And I created this Zimmer Twins uh, particular video to show that I understood some of the information my science teacher was trying to teach me about volcanoes. And here's just a little example. And it might show up just a little choppy, um, but feel free to get in there and just experiment with things. And the long intro I put into this particular project that I was working on. But the lyrics of the song that I developed actually showed all of the things that I understood from my instruction about volcanoes. And again, just a, another free tool out there that allows our students, especially even our youngest students, to really own a project, um, to become very engaged with the way that they might be trying to show us that they know and that they understand uh, the material we've be try been trying to teach them. A way we can kind of support them in their efforts to get on the web and to use some online resources to be able to show us what they know. And even for our youngest, youngest students, I think Zimmer Twins is an example of something that's built for those youngest students to be able to do that as well. Um, and that kind of closes things out for me as far as the presentation. Again, there's the QR code to be able to access it if you want to have you know, those resources at hand, um, some of those slides about rubrics. And, and I've tried to build some extensive notes into those slides as well. Um, might be helpful to you as well. And Jenny, what do you think? Awesome. I love it. Um, I, I'm really right. excited about all of the tools that you shared this evening as, for two reasons. Number one, because they're free. Um, and, you know, with limited budgets and um, resources, it's great to be able to leverage and use tools that don't cost a penny. Um, so I think that's exciting. But what really excites me the most is the fact that these tools, as, an assess, as a, a resource to assess students, um, these tools give us that immediate feedback that allows us to, it informs our instruction and it allows us to change our instruction based on that information. And I think that's the biggest benefit that these tools provide is the fact that, you know, I can do a quick, I can do a quick hand check and say, raise your hand if you understand this concept. And of course the kids are going to raise their hand. Um, you know, when I taught middle school social studies, they'd all raise their hand and say, yes, got it, let's move on. Because they don't want to raise their hand and say, I didn't get it. Um, you know, and then, and I think they understand it, so we move on. But just that quick, um, immediate check for understanding and then being able to differentiate what needs to happen next for certain groups of students based on their knowledge and where they're at 
is really powerful. I think, um, you know, at the end of the day, if we don't use these tools to change our instruction, then what's really the purpose or the point of using them? So um, yeah. I'm really excited about the fact that these are free and the fact that it really empowers teachers to differentiate and change um, their practice based mm -hmm. on the information that they're receiving. Yeah, so well uh, said, Jenny. And I think, I think you know, the thing we do, too, with all of these is, is we just help try to create a toolbox of potential evaluation tools that we can use ourselves. And that at times, at many times, we kind of turn those tools, we, we slowly start to teach those tools to our students. And, and like you said in your work with the students in, in Albuquerque, you know, the speed that they pick up the ability to efficiently use these tools to show what they know and they understand is, is just, it's alarming. It's amazing how fast the students are able to adapt to these new technology-based tools. And then to slowly build a toolbox for them as students. So kind of going back to that point of differentiating our assessment or student evaluation techniques, kind of giving the students free reign to be able to practice in the way that's best for them, to be able to, you know, provide a full performance task for us um, to be able to measure exactly what they know and that we can then kind of move on and, and change our instruction, like you said, that next day based on those results. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, so again, Jason, thank you so much for joining us this evening. I think it was incredibly useful information that these are tools and resources and strategies that can be used immediately. So thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, and just to give a quick reminder um, that our What's the 411 webinar next month will be hosted on April 9th, um, and the focus is on accessibility, reaching and teaching all kids the DE way. So um, again, just really excited that Jason was able to join us this evening, and we hope you can join us next time. Thank you all for joining, and have a great night.